Hey, Grace Chapel, good to see all of you here this morning. Why don't you go ahead and be seated if you're here live and if you're watching this live online. Welcome, good morning. I can't wait to see your face when you're back in this place, but it's good to see all of you here. How many of you, is this your first time back? to Grace Chapel Live. Great. So we have a bunch of you who have come back this morning. Thank you. And we get the second service today live on campus as well, which is our first time in six months to be back with two services. And right now, our kids are all checking in and going to kids' ministry up through the kindergarten, which is super cool. I'm just excited because it feels like, not that we've returned back to normal, but that some of the opportunities we had to gather together as a church are here, and it's such a blessing. And I'm so full of excitement. You're going to have to just hold me back today because I have so many things that I can't wait to share with you and tell you about what God is doing So let's dive into it. Let's talk about God's faithfulness today, but let's pray and dedicate our time to him this morning. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for what you have done to continue to allow people to come back to church and then for a vibrant online community to still exist. God, we thank you for what you're doing. We celebrate that you are faithful now and that you have been faithful every step of the way through this last unpredictable year. God, we thank you for the way that you've preserved our church for so long, for some 40 plus decades, or 40 years, uh, ten, four decades now, Lord. You've, you've proven your, yourself so faithful. You, you've constantly pointed us back to our true hope. You've constantly reminded us of who our true leader is. You've constantly made you and your son, Christ, the head of this church and your Holy Spirit, the power in this church. So God, before my brothers and sisters today, I pray and ask that as we recount your faithfulness, that you will guide us, that you will protect us, that our minds will be attentive, and that we will be on guard against the enemy, and that we will have an attitude of worship, a spirit of unity today, as we recount just how faithful you have been. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. Well, a year ago, uh, we set out with a vision that I thought was a great vision. Uh, We thought we had a hold of where our church was at. We thought we knew exactly where God was leading us. We thought we knew where we were going. I had gotten through some really hard things personally and had an excitement last fall to lean in on what God was doing for us as a church. My my outlook was positive. And and yet it seems like we started that 12-month cycle totally blind to what was about to come. It seems like a year ago when we started, which would have been June 30th was the end of our fiscal year last year, July 1, we started our new year. It seemed like we had a grip on something tightly. It seemed like we knew where we were going, but then God said, I have something bigger for you. I have something greater for you. I have something altogether different for you. We thought we were gripping on to something that was alive, and our vision was good, and I'll share that with you today, but we had no idea what 2020 would entail for not just our church, but for the whole world and for the church at large. It reminds me of a man I read about in New York City who had to change one of these large seven-foot fluorescent light bulbs in his office. He grabbed the light bulb, he went into his office, he was able to change the light without shattering it at all. And he had this seven-foot dead light bulb that he now had to discard. Well, he thought, well, I'm two stops down on the subway. I'll just take the light bulb with me down on the subway, and I'll throw it away in the dumpster near my apartment. He gets on the, the subway, and he holds the pole, the, the light pole vertically with the bottom on the floor and seven feet up into the air, and he's just holding the pole there. Well, as everybody else started getting on the train with him, they started grabbing onto his light pole because they assumed that it was a stanchion. And so now the crowd around him is all holding onto the light pole, and he knows it's a light bulb that's dead and useless, but they're all grabbing onto it in hopes that it will hold them still. It finally came to his exit on the subway, and he just gently let go of the light pole and walked off of the subway. (laughs) And I feel like in some ways, that's even where the church as a whole was at last year. We thought we had a hold of the strategy, the light, we knew where we were going, and yet God's like, hold on, I got something you have no idea about. Prior to, prior to March of this year, I would have told you, man, we're growing, we're experiencing some incredible times as a church. We're living in the, 
the light of the health and the wealth and the prosperity of our economy and our world and ministries flourishing. But then this pandemic comes and we find ourselves gripping onto something that no longer worked. It had to be thought of differently. Everything had to change. And as your pastor, I'm convinced that we now need to lay a hold of something that is new, that is greater, that is brighter than anything we had our grips on prior to March of this year. God has advanced his church And I think the opportunity for us to join him in what he's doing is massive. We can't keep standing still. We can't keep holding on to a model that has now changed because the world's changed. Rather, we have to advance ourselves and lead into the future and the fruitful ministry that God has for us in the days ahead. So today is Vision Sunday. Today is a day where I will cast some vision for where we're going on next year. But before we do that, we're going to do what we do every Vision Sunday. We're going to celebrate what God has done over this last year. We're going to spend time celebrating. Now, it is very rare at Grace Chapel for us to set aside our study of Scripture just to talk about what's happened in our midst. But let me tell you, even though it's rare for us to do something like that, and we will get to some passages, I'm about to read one here in a moment, but even though it's rare for us to set aside our study of Scripture for a moment and for us to to celebrate what God's doing uh, or has been doing over the last year, it's not unbiblical. In fact, the Bible's full of examples of where we should be celebrating what God is doing. In fact, the Old Testament commanded people to stop and to remember his faithfulness. So that's what we're going to do here today. That's what we're going to spend some time doing. I do want to set the theme with a passage. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to Acts chapter 2. And I want to read just a passage here that we're going to look at later on in our service today. But I want to read this to help set the theme for where we're going in Acts chapter 2. You can go ahead and let go of the subway picture, please. And let me just uh, read this passage. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now I want you to focus on this passage. Verse 44, And all who believed were together and had all things in common. This passage stopped me in my tracks when I started thinking about what this next year is going to look like for us as a church. We've been a church that's been dispersed. In the early church, of which Acts chapter 2 is the early church, or the account of the start of the church after the Holy Spirit had come and dwelt in all believers. Now they are dispersed in some ways. They're meeting in homes. They're all over these 10 different Roman cities on the, on the east side of Galilee. There would have been some in Jerusalem. There would have been some because of the missionary journeys that were to come from Paul's efforts and the apostles' efforts. But they were a church that is dispersed. And there's yet this passage here that says they were together and had all things in common. And I started thinking about us as a church. We're, we're We're dispersed. We've been all over the place. You're watching online right now. You guys are in this room right now. People are dispersed, yet we still as a church can be together wherever we are, together having all things in common. These these people in the early church did several things, of which I'll account for, for later on this morning. But I want you to see one thing they did in verse 43. It says, they had awe. Awe came upon them. All came upon every soul because of what God was doing, the wonders and signs that were being done in their midst. So let's spend some time having some awe. Let's look back at what God has done and recount his faithfulness over this last year. Are you with me for a moment on that? I got lots of stories to tell you. A year ago, on our last Vision Sunday, I said that we would commit to do four main things in the next 12 months. I said that we would make the weekend service the best it can possibly be, the best that we can offer Christ and other people. I said that we would create a clear pathway to help people follow Christ. I said that we would make Grace Chapel feel like a place to lead, a place to love and to, uh, to feel love, but also to love others. And I said that we would be a church who would get fearless in our outward-facing ministries to reach the unsaved. That's what I told you one year ago we would do. 
in my estimation, we've hit this goal about 70 or 80 percent. But we had COVID and things happen in our midst that stopped us or slowed us down. But God came in and advanced other things we never even anticipated. He advanced our prayer culture. He advanced our youth ministry. He advanced our kids' ministry. He advanced our local impact to our community. He advanced our financial health. He advanced our Sunday morning gatherings, both online and live. God did all sorts of things that were not in these original goals. Let me tell you about some of the things he did. Kids' ministry, for example. Let's start there. Our kids' ministry was doing amazing ministry by gathering people together here on our campus on Sunday morning and Tuesday evenings. We had a vibrant gathering ministry. Come and be with us. But then March 15th happened, and we had to close down as a church. And now our kids' ministry team had to totally reinvent themselves. Prior to closing down, we saw some of our most vibrant days in the kids' ministry. Some of our biggest numbers we've had in kids' ministry. We had 25 kids and their parents at our cross-training class, which is our fundamentals of the faith class for kids. 25 people come to that class, our biggest class we've ever had. Great things happening prior to the pandemic. Then the pandemic happens. We can't have kids' ministry anymore. We can't, we can't gather people anymore. So our kids' team reinvent themselves and they do a couple things. Here's one thing they did. They started sending postcards to every kid in our kids' ministry saying, we miss you. We love to have you back. We can't wait to see you again. We miss you. Many parents shared how grateful they were for this touch point. One parent wrote this. She said, my daughter keeps her card next to her bed each night and reads it every day. The cross sticker on the front of the card is a great reminder for me to talk about Jesus each day with my daughter. We are passionate as a church to help parents become the primary discipler of their kids. And we saw that start to happen by our kids' ministry team having to reinvent themselves and saying, how do we help parents at home? One of the greatest things that happened this last year is we launched this thing called Family Kits. These family kits were ways for families to come together and have Bible teaching in their homes with an object lesson. The kids would look forward to getting the box. They'd open the, the box. We had over 90 families participating with this and getting it every single week. And parents teaching their kids about Jesus and about the Bible in their homes. Our tagline with this campaign and getting these kits out was creating healthy spiritual rhythms at home. Our hope was that we could take the pandemic and create healthy spiritual rhythms at home. Each week, our team came together. They assembled these boxes. We got them together. We distributed them. It was a little bit crazy, but it was fantastic. And we think it set a precedent for something we're hoping to do in the future. Let's talk about our youth ministry for a second. We had a new youth pastor show up eight weeks before the start of the pandemic. That's one crazy way to start a new ministry. He shows up. He moves here. And we had an incredible interim youth pastor team who helped kind of keep everything together after the loss of Kurt Roberts, our previous youth pastor. They handed Mike Svatek, our new youth pastor, a healthy ministry. And because the ministry was healthy, it was able to keep going through Zoom meetings or meetings in the park or meetings outside on our campus. Mike tells me one of the, my favorite stories about their meeting at John Derry Park was when he's teaching about living water and all of a sudden the sprinklers come on. And all the kids have to disperse uh, here in this moment as he's having youth group in the park. There's memories we'll cherish through that with our youth ministry. Twelve youth made a decision for Christ this year at our winter camps. Can we just praise the Lord for that? Twelve students. Thirty-two people joined our prayer warriors team who are praying for our students on a regular basis. I love that. They kept meeting and were uninterrupted in their meeting. The early church kept meeting and were uninterrupted in their meeting. Though they were dispersed, they were still together. They had everything in common. The same was true for us. We were uninterrupted in our meeting on Sundays, whether it was virtual or live on campus. We never missed a Sunday for church. We had church every single Sunday. And I have to read you this email from a lady. She wrote about our online church. Listen to this. She says, COVID has truly been a blessing for my family, where once there was a scared person, too shy and gripped by anxiety to walk into church. There is now a warm kitchen, a cup of coffee, and an iPhone projecting Pastor Josh's beautiful, blessed messages. 
Where once there was spotty church attendance that plagued a heart full of misunderstanding, again gripped by anxiety at the thought of walking into a crowded church room, there is hope in a blue notebook full of complete sermons, series after series. When Grace Chapel went online, I started listening across two households. I can now go free from Satan's hold over me and the anxiety he used to keep me from, that used to keep me from God's word. My faith is growing. My family is speaking God's word where once there was no conversation. Because of online church, God has come into my home, not COVID. And my anxiety about church has calmed. Isn't that awesome? I didn't love online church, I'll be honest with you. But God used it and allowed us to still be together wherever we were and reach people that maybe were scared to enter a crowded room or had never been exposed to the church before. During the shutdown, our online team showed up here every Sunday. They hosted the service live, socially distanced, of course, and they made sure that they were corresponding with those who were online. In fact, I know there's many online watching church right now. Why don't you just put in the chat, thank you, online team, because they're still hosting right now, and we're not going to stop that, and it's been a sweet community that's happened there online. Uh, Our outreach ministry never stopped either. You know, we give 15% of everything that comes into this church right back out these doors, and 15% of everything that came in to our church still went to support local and global missions. This last year, we were able to help a project come to completion in Niger that we had planned and were supporting. Uh, Then in Asroli, we were able to uh, have uh, other projects, church buildings, water resources come to fruition. We provided medical clinics, church buildings, and water resources globally, even in spite of the things we were facing because of the pandemic. God kept all of our international missionaries healthy. There were a few that got COVID, but they came back and they're still going well. All of our national ministry partners, they kept doing well. And then we decided in the middle of COVID that we needed to open up a food bank. We didn't have one here. We had little donations we could give to people, but we said, why don't we start a food bank? So like this, we started a food bank and and you all came and donated all sorts of key staple items that we were able to deliver to those in need during the pandemic and specifically during the shut-in stay-at-home orders. We also increased our our giving to help people with rent so that nobody would go homeless. And we gave over $20,000 away to help support people so they could stay in their homes when the economy went to put over the uh, stay uh, stay home orders. Isn't that awesome? Can we just thank the Lord for that? Oh, that's not all, folks. That's not all. Listen to this. Our women's ministry kept on meeting. They kept gathering. Even here in the parking lot, they called a taco truck, had it come on over to the church. They shared tacos and fellowship together. We had over 100 women that stayed in our Bible studies virtually, and then some of them still meeting physically on porches. They were able to study God's Word, learn how to study God's Word uh, for themselves, not just with a teacher or a pastor in the room. They studied Ephesians. They studied Psalm 119. They just continued on loving God's word. And then we started this women's mentoring uh, program where we're mentoring younger women. We started Grace-Filled Moms, which is for those young moms who need some mentorship and encouragement. These things started in this last year. Our women's ministry was so vibrant in this last year and will only be more so in the year to come. Our men's ministry, similarly. We had several gatherings of men here on this campus. We call it the men's barbecue. You know, we had some beef and some meat, and and we all hung out together, and, and we connected with one another, and we were challenged to have spiritual impact in the domains that God has entrusted to us. We saw men get plugged into more groups because of these barbecues. I'll never forget the night Eric, this man Eric, shared his testimony at one of our barbecues. It was the barbecue right before we got shut down. He had come to Grace Chapel this last year. He gave his life to Jesus Christ this last year. He then got mentored by somebody at Grace Chapel in this last year. He joined a Bible study in this last year. And then he shared his testimony at the men's barbecue last year, all testifying to God's faithfulness in his life. That's only one example of things that happened. We had men's groups that split into all different subgroups to help widows who needed help in this last year, living out James 127. We had the largest camping trips we've ever had in our men's ministry for fathers and daughters and fathers and sons, seeing multi-generations represented at those camps. 
and two salvations of two young boys who gave their life to Christ at one of our camps. Isn't that awesome? It was an amazing, amazing ministry. Not one single men's ministry group stopped meeting during COVID. They were together. They shared life. And they had all things in common. Our young adults ministry, our singles ministry, our college ministry, they kept meeting on Zoom for quite some time and then in John Derry Park. We started our college ministry a little bit early and a little bit bigger than we ever have because we had all these college students who were now sent home. And Pastor Steve will tell you that one of the greatest parts of his ministry in this last year for him personally was having these college students come together who were displaced from the life they were living as college students and now had to or were able to experience authentic discipleship and community with other college students who were also stuck back at home until their colleges reopened. Our Sunday adult communities, they're amazing. Many of them are meeting right now, but our Sunday adult communities kept on meeting virtually. Then they started meeting face-to-face -face when they could. They were able to have community together and study God's word faithfully. We have over 150 people that are in our Sunday adult communities that study God's word, and they never stopped. They kept on going. Now, we, we kind of became like an IT department for some of the groups for a while just as we had to help them figure out how do we even broadcast our classes. But I'm telling you, even our oldest people in our classes figured out Zoom, figured out WebEx, figured out Google, Google Groups, and they were all able to have Bible study together. They never stopped meeting. We launched two new small groups this year. That took us to 11 small groups that are now meeting outside of Sundays and studying God's Word together. Now, i got to tell you about this one. This is one of my favorite ministries that we have here at Grace Chapel. You're not supposed to have favorites, but it's one of my favorites because I see the Lord doing amazing things. It's the Hope of Denver. The Hope of Denver is our biblical counseling center where we now had five new people certified as biblical counselors, bringing our number to eight certified biblical counselors. These people give of their time for free to counsel anyone who needs counseling. They take people to God's word to show the sufficiency of scripture and point them back to Jesus Christ. Our team is now 11 people on our counseling team that are counseling, 11 counselors that are counseling. We had 101 people come to us this last year and ask for counseling. That's like 101 people coming and saying, how must I be saved? And we get to sit before them and say, well, listen, let me tell you what the Bible says. Roughly 25% of that number were from Grace Chapel. 75% of the people that came to the Hope of Denver were not even from our church. They were either from the community or from other surrounding churches, and we were able to serve them with the power of the gospel. And we saw three salvations happen in the Hope of Denver this last year. Can we just praise the Lord for that? Come on. We also had great reach beyond this campus, not just through the Hope of Denver and our outreach ministries, but through our radio ministry. Four times a day, Monday through Friday, the preaching ministry of Grace Chapel is heard on the radio here in Denver. Four times a day, five days a week. This last week, we had 2,000, over 2,500 downloads that, that, that came in from the last month. So we had a month's worth. I just got the number this last week. And I was texting this morning with the team that runs our radio ministry. And I said, Would I said does that mean we had about 10,000 downloads of our radio program? So this is just on the internet. This isn't talking about radio. Is that about 10,000 downloads that we had this year? And I get this text back this morning while sitting at my kitchen table. No, Pastor Josh, we had 20,773 downloads of Gospel Daily in the last 12 months. That's 20,000 plus downloads in addition to the radio that heard the preaching of God's Word from Grace Chapel. Isn't that so cool? Man. And people have been coming from the radio. People have been getting saved from the radio. One of our baptisms last year was because he heard it on the radio. It was unbelievable. Our prayer culture, though, I got to say, is the very thing that I believe sustains all of this. While these are great things and we're in awe of what God has done, if it wasn't for our dependence upon prayer and on the Lord, I believe these things wouldn't have happened. We never stopped praying. Our prayer meetings were some of the highlight of my year in this last year. Every other month we gathered before COVID. We had a meal together and we prayed together during COVID. 
We had online prayer events, and our online prayer events were some of our most watched and observed prayer events of all the services we've put out over the last 30 weeks. I want you to hear me clearly, church. Prayer is not an add-on to the ministry of Grace Chapel. It is the core of our ministry. When the apostles came together and they met together, you see in verse 42, they broke bread and they prayed. What do we do? We pray and we pray and we pray and we keep seeking the Lord. Prayer is the how-to of our ministry at Grace Chapel. (laughs) Now to Sunday mornings. Sunday morning ministry obviously is a big part of my job description and a huge part of my heart. But I believe that God went before us to preserve our Sunday mornings in a way that doesn't even make sense to me. I had told you last year that it was laid on my heart that we needed to get rid of the pews that were in this place and we needed to put in chairs. And then in December of last year, I told you, I think it's like borderline conviction issue. I have to get rid of these pews and get new carpet. And I know I even had some who said, really, is that the best way we should be spending our money? I said, I don't know why, but I feel like the Lord told me we got to do this. And that was in December. And then in March, pandemic happens. And the men come together and they cut these pews in half and they hauled these pews out, which was no small thing, by the way. And they made way for us to not only have online church right here in the middle of this room when no chairs were here, so we had a place to broadcast from, but they made it so that we could have this right now, a socially distanced room where we could all sit in safety and still worship together. God went before us and did some unbelievable thing and things by making this room better and more conducive for worship. And the men, the men, they came in and they did the heavy lifting, quite literally, right? And they cleared it out and made a way for us to experience what we're having here today. Can we just thank the Lord through the men? Just a couple more things that I want to share with you. Our online church, it was sweet. It was hard. 11 weeks with none of you in this place. 11 weeks of really about 10 of us in a room shooting Sunday service. And we did both services every single Sunday. And I had to talk to a camera lens. That's not what I went to seminary to do. It felt so weird. But God was amazing. Amazing to bring together the connections we needed to be able to pull it off. We dusted off old cameras We hired more help to get what we needed technologically speaking. We had many, many volunteers come in to help us pull it off, both getting ready for Sunday and then the Sunday service. While it was a season that I don't really ever want to go back and do again, it's a season that I will forever cherish in my heart because I saw God's faithfulness in sustaining us. And some of the times we worshiped in here, not knowing where the rest of you were and how you were watching, some of those times were some of the most moving times I've ever experienced in worship in my life. Because God was doing something. We were together, though we were dispersed. And then June 7th happened. June 7th is like Christmas to a pastor. All of a sudden, we all got to come back. Church got to open, and we reopened after countless hours of meeting as a staff to figure out how in the world would we have people back in this place. And and there we were on June 7th, having a cap of only a 175, but I'll take it. I wanted anybody to come back that could come back. And we came back, and I felt like we slammed the restart button as a church. And the joy that I had that morning of seeing people back together and we've had every single day as people have come back and joined us for worship has been so sweet. I got to tell you, it took so much work to pull off even what you all have experienced here today. What our connections team has done to make all of this happen has been amazing. What our production team, our staff, our kids ministry today, it's unbelievable. But we do it because we love God and we love the people of God. And we love it when we get to worship his name together. I'll never forget standing right over here on the side of the stage with Molly, singing the blessing that day that we all came back. It was, it was an amazing moment because we're singing this song that had kind of become like an anthem for all of us during COVID. I don't mean just Grace Chapel, but like the church at large. And watched you all sing at the top of your lungs as we realized God has been so faithful. On Vision Sunday, I usually report out on the attendance, 
and the giving. So let me do that real quick. And then I just want to praise the Lord. Our attendance looks a little bit like a lopsided taco. (laughs) It's a weird year. We saw great growth and excitement. Uh, We were getting in numbers of six and 700 adults and a couple hundred kids here on Sundays prior to the pandemic. That means we would have been about eight or 900 people gathering on our campus on a weekend. And then all of a sudden we had 11 weeks of no meeting and now we have a cap of 175 in the room at one time. We hit that cap almost every single Sunday that we've been back. So in some ways, I guess you could say it's been really sweet to see our attendance and how it bounced right back. Now we're at two services, and I'm excited that those services are nearly full today, and we have them back. And soon, I hope we have kids' ministry open again. But we're also tracking our online attendance, and we find that you who are watching online, you're, you're watching all over the place, in Facebook and YouTube and church online. But, but to the best of our esp- estimation, by looking at all the stats and all the clicks, we still have about 1,000 people who are watching our weekend service, both live and online. So guess what? We didn't shrink We might have even grown. We've about stayed the same at least. That in and of itself is amazing. If we've reached more, then hallelujah. But all of that says God is faithful and he's kept us together. And oh, the financials. (laughs) The financials just don't even make sense to the human mind. When COVID hit, I had our executive pastor and our business director pull me into the office and say, Josh, we're probably going to decline by 45% because that's how much giving came in on Sundays. And I said, okay. We came up with plans, what we'd have to do. This was before the the loan from the government. If we could even apply for that, we didn't even know. We, We had no idea what the future looked like. I thought it was grim days ahead for us. And never once did we ever have to go to a place of saying, we're done, we got to cut this or cut that or cut this staff member or cut that staff member because of finances. You all switched and started giving online. God faithfully supported us in an unbelievable way and we got stronger financially in this last year. Stronger! How does that happen? Like that doesn't even make sense given what we've gone through in this last year. Let me share with you. In giving, we received $2.9 million that came in to support the ministry at Grace Chapel. Before COVID, 12 months ago, we estimated in faith that you all would give $2.8 million. So you uh, far exceeded the budget uh, almost by $87,000 or over $87,000 came in in unanticipated generosity. Let's just praise the Lord for that. And as for expenses, we spent $2.6 million to keep our ministry going here. We had planned to spend $2.7 million, but our staff tightened the belts. We watched every penny. We saved $102,000, which means that we as a church ended with an extra $200,000 plus from what we expected. Forget COVID. This is $200,000 above what we expected in a COVID year. That is God's faithfulness. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. There are so many other stories that I want to tell you about God's faithfulness, but I said to our team, why don't we take the month and tell them on social media. So this month, if you'll follow us on our social media channels, we're going to have videos and we're going to have things to tell you. So find us on Instagram, find us on Facebook, and we'll tell more stories of God's faithfulness. We aren't doing the annual report this year that we've usually done. It's a magazine of information we've given you. We decided not to do that this year. So we're going to do that through social media. So if you're not already following us, please go follow us at one of these locations locations and get more information about what God's doing. Share it. Celebrate it. It isn't us bragging on ourselves. Listen, I want you to hear this. We didn't do this. We didn't do this. God did this. This was not us. God did this. And I'm so grateful for our staff and our elders, our deacons, our volunteers, our class leaders. I'm grateful for all of you. But I know that we didn't do this. God did this. And it's only by God's grace that we could have ever seen any of this happen. God did this. God did this. Say that with me. God did this. This is about what he did, not about what we did. A few weeks ago, I was sitting at my desk in my office right over here on campus. 
And I found this song that just brought me to tears. I'm sitting at my desk and recounting God's faithfulness over the last few years, yet alone the last 40 years to Grace Chapel. And this song came on. It's called The Story I'll Tell. And it started playing and I just started weeping. Like the tears just were not like, not like an uncontrollable sob, but more of that like, this is a divine moment. Josh, would you just stop whatever you're doing and, and let me speak? And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, Josh, the story that Grace Chapel needs to keep telling is the story of my faithfulness. you got to keep talking about my faithfulness. I faithfully preserved you, little Josh Weidman. I've faithfully preserved Grace Chapel. I'm faithful. And that should be the story that you never stop telling. So I listened to that song, was moved by it, played it over Zoom for my whole staff. And I said, I want you to listen to this and I want you to realize that we have a story of God's faithfulness to tell. This morning, I want you to listen to this. If you know the words, then sing along. As you start to learn the song, then sing along. But pay attention to the words and realize that the story we're going to tell is about the battles he's won, the faithfulness he's displayed. It's about God and God doing this. Let's listen. It's hard to see what you are doing here in the ruins and where this will lead. Oh, but I know that down through the years, I'll look on this moment and see your hand on it. And know you were here. And I'll testify of the battles you've won. How you were my portion when there wasn't enough. And I'll testify of the seas that we've crossed. The waters you parted, the waves that I walked, singing.
we'll be singing. So sing hallelujah to the rock of ages. We're oh, singing. Thank you, worship team. The story we'll tell is the story of God's faithfulness. He's done this. God did this. And because of his faithfulness, we have every reason to continue forward as a church and, and, and still serve him and be connected to his greater mission, which is to make his son known in South Denver. I'd like to spend just a few more minutes by giving you some vision casting for the future. I'd like us to look forward. Where do we go from here? With a great year that we've had with the pandemic and the way that God did accelerating things through it, where do we go from here? Here's where I think we go. Let me illustrate it with a story from our past. There was a day when we opened the new building on the corner of Colorado and University, or excuse me, Rapaho. On the corner of Colorado and Rapaho, that's where our first building still exists today. But I was, I was only, man, what would I have been, like four? And we were attending the church as kids, and we opened this new property um, in 1985. And we're excited about what this would become and how we would lean into now having church. And we quickly outgrew our property. Can you imagine the stress of that? You all of a sudden open a brand new property, and you realize we don't fit here. And we need to build again. And so we built a second story onto that church, of which my dad was a part of the, the, the second story committee. Um, and there was a, a lot of construction that hap- had to happen very quickly on a new building. But we then expanded and opened up a second story so that we could all fit in this new building. To be honest, we only fit there for about a decade. And then we had to find a new place uh, because God continued to expand our ministry. But when I think about building a second story, I think about that illustration from our past, Uh, I, I want to apply it to where we're at today. I believe it is time for us to be a second level church, to build the second story. It's time that we build a second level. Now let me explain what this means. I think in some ways we have been a little bit caught on living our ministry and doing our ministry on the first level. Now, the first level, follow my analogy here, the first level of church, the the main level of a house or the main level of a building is where most traffic happens. It's where most of your stuff exists. And for a church, it's where most of the stuff of church exists. And these aren't bad things, but they're just the stuff of church. And then most people enter on the first level, live there for a while, commune there for a while, but they should advance to the second level, which is where the family hangs out. That's, that's the more important and, and more prominent part of the home. The more meaningful things happen on the second level. I want us to move to the second level, away from the first level. Let me tell you what I think is on the first level of every church, but specifically of our church. First of all, a first level church has people come to the church and into the church because of its place. They like the location. Uh, They like the building. They think it's a cool building. They think it's cool that we get to connect here. Maybe for our building... There's parts of it that I don't think that are that cool, but some of you might think it's really cool. We have nine different buildings on our property, five major properties, our own youth building. That's that's amazing. Some people say, let's come to the church because of its location, its place. In South Denver, I think we have an epidemic of people going to church because of the place, a shiny building, a location, convenience. 
I'm not saying it's bad, but it can't be the only reason you come to church. Another thing that I think is a first-level church is people, uh, connecting with other people. Now, you might say, well, why would you put people in the first-level church? Isn't the church people? Well, yes, people are on both levels, but I think some people come to a church and remain only on the first level because of their connection or familiarity with other people. They like to go to a place where everybody knows their name. And to be honest with you, there are probably some bars that do connecting with people better than even some of the Christian church does in America. You can't just come because you feel comfort and familiarity with other people. It has to be something deeper than location. It has to be something deeper than connection with other people. Another thing that happens in the first level is programs. The, the, these are things you can do, things you can participate in, studies you can be a part of. The, these are all good, and programs are important, but programs are not the end game. When you get to heaven, Christ will not say, how many Bible studies did you attend at Grace Chapel? i got to check it off. He doesn't ask you about what programs you're in. Now, Bible studies can be a means for you to grow in your faith. Serving and other things can be a means for you to grow in your faith, but you shouldn't just be coming to, to a church because they have good programs. Another part of a first level church is personality. People come to a church because they like the pastor. And if you come here because you like me, please let me help you find another church because I will let you down at some point. Don't come here because of me. Don't come here because of any of our staff. Don't come here because of the personalities of the leadership. That's a first level thing. Place, people, program, and personalities. Those are first level church things. Now to be honest, I think these are provisions of the Lord. He does give us first level things in order to do church. But we have to move from provisions to his greater vision. We have to move from the things that he's given us that allow us to connect and experience church in the lower room and move to the upper room. If we stay in the lower room as a church, then we will be trapped in a consumeristic mindset. If you stay in the lower room, then when all of a sudden your friends bolt because they found a prettier or a better preacher or a better worship team or a prettier building or, or whatever it may be, you'll bolt and you'll be out of here because you're only coming to church for first level things. But a second level church is a church that's saying we're not about consumerism. We're not about just the provisions, but we're about being part of God's greater vision. A second level church means that we're connected to and engaging in God's vision for us and where we are to go as a unique and divinely placed local church here in South Denver. Now let me be biblical about this for a second. I believe Jesus had many people who came to his lower level ministry, thousands actually. They liked his food. They liked his personality. They liked to hear him teach. They liked the other people that followed him. But there were only 120 people who joined him in the upper room later on in his ministry. We must be part of the 120. We must be the people who move from a consumeristic mindset, the place, the programs, the people, the personalities. We must be a church that goes to the upper room and enjoys greater intimacy with Christ and with Christ's people. Our mission here at Grace Chapel is to lead people to find and follow Jesus. We do this by fulfilling the great commandment and the great commission. And we want to help you be the kind of person that's connected to a mission and a vision of Jesus Christ that is much more than what you experience by the color of carpet or the location or the cool kids ministry or youth ministry or the people that are there. We want you to experience church the way the Bible experienced church. Back to our passage, and I'll close with this. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47 talks about what the church did. Let me read this to you one last time, and I'll leave us on this, and then we'll dive back into our study in Acts in the weeks to come. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day attended the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That church didn't have an attraction mindset. It wasn't come into our lower 
level church, but it was like, hey, we are God's mission people. We are God's vision people. We're leaving from this place to go make sure that the world hears about God's faithfulness and the truth of the gospel. And God did this. God added to their number day by day. Several things happened in this early church. They studied the Bible together. They prayed and worshiped. They had fellowship together. They were sharing and caring. They had the Lord's Supper together. And they saw many signs and wonders. We're going to study this more fully in the months to come about what it means for us to be this kind of church. But this is an upper room church. This is an upper room church who are all about being empowered and enabled to go out into the world and make his faithfulness and the truth of Jesus Christ known. In this next year, there are four things that I've asked our staff to focus in on. I want to share them with you briefly. Number one, we're going to focus in on grace at home. We want to make sure that you and you who are at home are as equipped as possible to have church at home and to be the primary disciplers of your family. We're gathering people in homes. We'd like to have 10 different home sites watching church on Sunday mornings. We'd like to give you resources as parents to continue to teach your kids. We'd like to launch more small groups, but we're going to focus on what does it mean for our church to exist outside of this property and in homes across our city. We're also going to spend some time developing what I call Grace Online. This is a place for you to come, to be equipped, to, yes, connect with other people virtually, virtually, but mostly for you to find what you need to be equipped to fulfill God's mission in your life. Each one of you impacts at least 12, if not 120 other people that don't come to church here. We want to equip you through online courses that we're going to launch this year that will help you be better at being a missionary in the place where God has placed you. We're also going to continue to develop grace on site and make sure that what we do here worships the Lord, not just on Sunday morning, but we're going to have live worship nights here. We're going to do prayer nights, of course, continually, and other great live events that I can't wait to tell you more about. And in this next year, we will continue to develop grace in need. We're going to host our first biblical counseling online summit, training other churches in biblical counseling so that they can do what we're able to do through the Hope of Denver. We're going to make sure that we have a food bank and ministry for those in need. We're going to continue to support our neighbors who can't afford their homes through benevolence and helping them find sustainable opportunity to keep on living life. And I'm really excited about a little dream we have for our neighbors across the street, Apex and Elevation, to open up a dog park right here on our property that allows us to have gospel conversations with people in our neighborhood who may not have ever attended a Sunday morning service. Grace on sight, grace in need, grace online, and grace at home. I leave you with this statement. We are Christ followers. And this passage in Acts says that they were those who believed. We are believers in Jesus Christ. Yes, we are leading people to find and follow Jesus. But we will do this better this year than we've ever done it by making sure that we're engaging the transforming power of Jesus to everyday life. I want you as church members of Grace Chapel to know the transforming power of Christ. And to know that it has practical implications every day in every Every environment that you live in, in every area of these vision statements that I shared with you, and in our study on the book of Acts, we are going to bring to life what it means to have the transforming power of Jesus Christ in our life every single day. So it's not that what we were holding on to didn't work in the past, it worked, but I'm not sure it will work in the future. It's time to grab a hold of something that is new, something that is bright, something that will carry us into the next 20 years of ministry. And we as a church must do this together, wherever we are. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity as a church to know the calling that we have, the upward calling to know Jesus Christ, your Son, That's a corporate calling as much as an individual calling, Lord. You've called us corporately to know your Son. But Lord, I do pray for the individuals here that they will know you and that they will love you. That they will have a saving relationship with you, not because of what they did to save themselves, but because of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ 
that has saved them. Lord, will you help us this year make the tangible power of Jesus real for everyday life? Will you please help us this year be like the first century church, praying together, sharing and caring, showing compassion, being bold, and doing all of this together, no matter where we are. We love you, Father. We trust you with our church, and we trust you with our future. This is your church, Father. It's in the name of your name we pray. Amen.